in our May 2023 series on healing prayer. We call it a deeper look. And we've had lots of cool topics we've talked about, but tonight is gonna be about hearing God's voice. Discerning what's God's voice, what's Satan's voice, and what are our, our voice? What does how does our voice sound different from either of those two? Um, so welcome to class, and I'm going to share a PowerPoint. Uh, but first, I want we wanted to talk just a little bit about how we even how we learned more about this topic when. Ken and I went to a conference in 2011, Christian Healing Ministries. We were blown away by Holy Spirit, and we started taking their classes on how to pray for healing. And almost right from the get-go, they say that we have two ears for a purpose. One is to listen to somebody's story, and the other is to listen to Holy Spirit or the voice of God. So how do you do that? How do you how do you listen to one person with one ear and Holy Spirit with the other? So we we learned, we learned and we learned and we learned and we practiced. But then someone named Mark Verkler came on the scene and can say a little bit about him. Yeah. So I first learned about Mark Verkler when I took a class called Prayers That Heal the Heart. And that's a really good class if anyone wants to take, you know, it's got a workbook and stuff. It's really good. Um, and so I learned a little bit about, you know, what the enemy speaks against us and, and how that weighs our heart down. But then I took a class from him called Four, Key, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. And that's when I, I really started to really catch on to what he was saying and pay attention to those thoughts that come into my mind. Um, I used to always think they were just my own thoughts. I didn't attribute them to anything outside myself, but I learned that that there, those, the source of those thoughts are not always just myself. So we're going to be doing that. We're going to teach a little bit about Mark Verkler at the end, but then we're going to practice hearing God's voice. It's very exciting because God is always with us and he truly is always speaking to us. It's just a matter of discernment. Uh, so let me share a PowerPoint. So as I said, this is the sixth class of our May series, Discerning God's Voice from Satan's Lies. How do I know if I am hearing God or Satan or I'm just talking to myself? And the reason I picked this slide that's a little blurry <clears throat> is for a reason, because it seems kind of blurry, uh, sometimes, who are we hearing? So many voices. And Ken and I were talking about the class a couple of days ago, and, and he was asking some of these questions. Why would people take this class? So we we started writing them down. You want to say the one? All right. So the first one is you want to hear God's voice, but you don't know if you actually have or not. And I know that was me for a very long time. Number two is you have lots of inner thoughts. Raise your hand if that's true for you. Lots of inner thoughts, but aren't sure of the source. Is it God? Is it Satan? Is your own mind? The next one is you don't know if you have ever heard from God or Satan and want to know if the thoughts in your head are just your own. Number four, you have a need for God's direction for a specific situation, and you want to find a way to know or to hear his will. You want to discern if the thoughts that make you feel badly are from your past, you know, maybe something a parent or a teacher has said or done, or Satan's whispers or God's conviction. Number six, you are in a battle and have faith that you can overcome by following God's directions if you could hear his voice. And the seventh one is... You just want to learn more. There's always something more with God, and this is another opportunity. So glad you're all here. So scripture makes it clear that Satan has at least some capacity to influence our inner conversation. There are three different scriptures that we're going to look at. 
Matthew, Acts, and then another one from Matthew. And this comes from Guy Saffold. He's the executive director of the Acts Seminaries in uh, British Columbia. Uh, so number one is Matthew 4, 1 through 10. This is fairly familiar story in the Bible where Jesus, after he was baptized, remember he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days, he was hungry. He fasted all that time. So the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And what did Jesus answer? It's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Clearly in the scripture, Jesus was hearing the voice of Satan, but he also was the word of God. In Acts 5, verse 3, there's the story about Peter and Ananias. And, and he says, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Get a load of this. Satan has had so influenced and spoken to Ananias that he lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for himself some of that money that he had received. Satan has so filled your heart. And that's what we do not want. We want to be able to discern when Satan is trying to fill our heads and thus our hearts with all those lies and all those little temptations. And that's what we're going to start to learn in this class. And, you know, I think that's a really interesting passage because, you know, Ananias gave most of the money as a gift, as an offering, but he just kept back some of it. and. Yeah, so even in our times when we think we are doing God's will, we can be influenced by the enemy. Good point. Matthew 16, 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And that was when, what was Peter saying to, to Jesus then? Get behind me. Was he saying, uh, oh, somebody probably knows out there? Well, Ken's looking it up. No, no, I'm not. All right. When Satan speaks, and you know, I put Satan in all these script, all these uh, PowerPoints as little s because that's what it, he is. We don't want to give him more credit than he deserves. We don't want to give him more credit. No. But when he speaks into our thoughts, he only has one purpose, and that's to do harm. So discouragement, temptation, frustration, depression, despair, his goal is always to divide us from God, to cripple our spiritual vitality, and to prevent us from obeying and serving God. And that, again, comes from Guy Saffold. So let me just admit another person here. Welcome, Cindy. I'm going to go ahead and mute you. All righty. I'm glad you're here. Whoopsie. All righty. Whoopsie. Sorry, guys. So, again, when Sp Satan speaks into our thoughts, it's discouraging and tempting and frustrating and depressing and despairing now the voice of holy spirit is very different the goal of the spirit is always edification to lift you up to encourage you to bring strength faith joy and peace you know that reminds me of a song that we always used to sing our to our kids the building 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 uh, there's a building they, they hated building that. they did <laughs> we like to sing it to them but that's what the goal of the spirit is to build you 
up. So does this mean that the voice of Holy Spirit always makes us feel good? Nope. So why not? Because Holy Spirit is the voice of God speaking to us. And since it's unlikely that we're going in just the right direction, okay. uh, there's going to be some correction. And in that correction, it, correction doesn't always feel good. That's right. So again, how do you know? How do you tell the difference between God's corrective discipline and the enemy's discouragement? Hopefully we'll find out a little more on how we can tell the difference tonight. Satan's voice brings judgment and condemnation. God comes with conviction and a way forward. And, yes. And, I, you know, one of the things I remember is, you know, Satan says you are a mistake and Holy Spirit says you made a mistake. And yeah. so, it, you know, if it's condemnation, then I think it's time to look carefully at where that's coming from. Yeah. So all of the things we've been talking about, uh, Jesus hearing Satan um, and, and, the whispers of discouragement or, or, or just feeling discouraged. Those are all kind of uh, blatant, I think, kind of obvious. But how about, look at this question. If God whispered, if he whispered, could you hear it? What do you think? If God whispered, could you hear it? So from Guy Saffold again, recognizing God's voice takes practice. So the next time you hear a whisper, ask yourself, is this keeping me trapped and away from God? Or is it moving me toward God and some type of obedient behavior? So if you just take a look at that picture, you, you may feel like that in parts of your life, that we are just surrounded by noise. People, cell phones, devices, cars, dogs barking. Everywhere we turn, the world is shouting at us in, in every type of way, every type of opinion. And amongst these voices, there's the voice of truth, which is God. And there's the voice of lies, which is Satan. So you may know these already, but scripture is so important. So the enemy's voice will rush you or push you, frighten you, confuse you, discourage you, worry you, or condemn you. Now, if one of those little phrases stuck out at you, if you always feel rushed, perhaps look up James 4, 7 and ponder that with Holy Spirit. You're, you're going to learn how tonight, how to ponder that with Holy Spirit. Um, if you're frequently confused, uh, or, or, or you hear a voice of confusion, lots of voices that confuse you, perhaps we read Genesis 3, 4 to 5. And, and I do want to say, I don't know if we said it already, but, you know, most of the time when we hear God, it's not like Moses heard God speak to him at the burning bush. Uh, but it's, it's those thoughts that come into our mind that we should pay attention to. And we're going to be talking about that towards the end with the Mark Berkler method. So God's voice comforts you, protects you, helps you, can convict you, certainly leads you, and will give you peace. Amongst many, many other things that God's voice can do. So am I hearing God? Am I only hearing myself or worse yet? Am I hearing the temptations of Satan disguised as the leading of Holy Spirit? Oh my goodness, what a thought. How do we take this every thought captive like in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 when we're not sure where they're coming from? So there are three things in this little segment of the talk. Pray. And you're like, oh, Lucinda, I pray. I'm still not understanding or discerning. Well, it's okay. We're going to keep praying. Doesn't it so, say somewhere in the Bible, pray continually in all circumstances? So we're going to keep praying. Even if we're, especially if we're confused, pray for wisdom. Look up James 1.5 to ponder that scripture. Um, and of course, we should always be asking God to make his will known to us clearly. Well, and, you know, we do have authority. God has given us authority over those 
evil voices that can be working against us. And so we can command them to be quiet so that we can hear God. So if you feel confused, perhaps just in the name of Jesus, command any spirit of confusion to stop their work. See what happens. Number two is study the word. Well, that makes sense. The Bible is God's word. That's the way God speaks to us. Matter of fact, in one of my journaling times, I was asking Jesus, all right, I had read, read a scripture and a uh, several scripture. And then I said, um, what I usually do, Jesus, what do you want to say to me? And he said, I've been talking to you all morning. <laughs> he cracks me up sometimes. And I just laugh because I had been reading the scripture and had been speaking to my heart. And of course he had been talking to me through the word. So if you don't have a dedicated Bible reading time, why don't you go ahead and schedule it in? All righty. And number three was follow Holy, Holy Spirit leading. Because Holy Spirit is God. And so as we connect with God through his Holy Spirit, we can then have the same mind. We can have the mind of Jesus and we can have the emotions and the will of Jesus. And when we get to that place, you know, then, then we're in great alignment with him and able to do all those things that he wants us to do. All right, one, two, three. So remember, I liked this quote. God wants us just to show us the right path to take, but look at that bottom one. God's not in the business of hiding his will from those who seek him. Just like, of course, that's truth. He's not hiding his will when we're trying to seek right, him. Right, because everyone who's a follower of God is seeking him, and he wants us to be able to follow him. So, yeah, if we're not hearing God, it's not because God's not talking to us. Right. So the more we listen to God, the better we will be. Oh, look, let's just go back to that a little bit, what Ken just said. It's not that God's not speaking to us. You know, I do remember um, in a, these, this series of classes talking about, or maybe it was a healing prayer service, but talking about the dark night of the soul. And sometimes, is that God not talking to us for a reason or is it just we can't hear him? I don't know. I don't know. But I just wanted to throw that in there because there, and if you're interested in, in reading any more about the dark night of the soul, you can contact me or, or someone else who might know. All right. So look at that scripture. Jesus, the good shepherd, gives us his promise. He says he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Others may speak, but the sheep do not listen to them. And that's what, what position we want to be in. Following the good shepherd, hearing his voice and not listening to the other voices. So the better we know the shepherd, the less we're going to have to worry about hearing the wrong voice. So I wonder what, and this is, if you want to chat this, that's fine, but you can talk about it in your small groups. What are some ways that you have practiced to be able to hear the good shepherd's voice. And remember, it takes time. We do need to practice and practice and practice. So here's our first exercise with our pen and pencil. On one side of your sheet, like put a line right down like a column. On one side of your sheet, make a list of just single words that describe what you think God's voice is like. And there's some examples, gentle, patient, kind, forgiving, encouraging. So you have 30 seconds, make a list of single words that describe what you think God's voice is like. And if you want to chat some of those, that's fine. We'll go, we'll read them off. Uh, and then on the other side of your page, write a separate list for what you think the voice of Satan is like. And there's some examples there, harsh, condemning, impatient, negative. So go ahead and write it down. What does, what do you think the voice of Satan's like?
Alrighty, so you have your list and we can, we're going to be talking about that in our small groups. And I got this from the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. And look at that bottom paragraph or phrase. If you look at your list right now, I would presume that there is a dramatic difference between these two. And according to the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, everyone regularly forgets this basic difference when they come to make key decisions. Huh. And they say, you already know how to discern in most situations. Interesting. So we're, we come to Mark Berkler and just a little history on Mark Berkler. So he was 15 years old when he came to know and accept Jesus into his heart as his Lord and Savior. And one night, God's voice was speaking to him. And he got up and he told his parents that um, he wanted to join the church. He wanted to be baptized. He wanted to be a Christian. Um, and the voice that he heard, he didn't audibly hear it. He, it. This came as a spontaneous thought inside of his head. But he didn't define this as the primary way that he could hear God's voice until he had completed, and he uses the word, a desperate 10-year search to hear him clearly. Desperate. Matter of fact, he took one whole year off and dedicated it to understanding how to hear God's voice, and hence came all his material. Whole year. Can you imagine taking a year off? and dedicating it to some kingdom purpose like this? How cool is that? So one of the keys is that God's voice in your heart often sounds like a flow of spontaneous thoughts. And so Mark uses the passage from Habakkuk um, to, to tie that to the Bible. And in Habakkuk, he knew that the sound of God speaking to him was, as described, there was a small voice, and he listened. Um, in Habakkuk, God says, stand, stand on the ramparts and, and look, and then write down what you hear. And that became like a foundational um, passage for the four keys of hearing God's voice. Um, so I, I think that the maybe the big point of this is that we really do have to pay attention to those thoughts because most of the time we're not going to hear an external voice speaking to us, but we will often hear an internal voice saying things to us that seems a lot like our thoughts, but much better. And all these keys come from the book, Four Keys to Hearing God's Voice. And it, the cover looks just like that picture there. So this is spirit level communication. Now, what I am doing right now is a human level communication. I am talking to you guys through this Zoom call and hopefully it's influenced by the spirit, but, but communicating, uh, hearing God is a spirit level communication. And we perceive that most of the times as spontaneous thoughts, impressions, and visions. And even Satan's thoughts come to us as these spontaneous thoughts, which is why we're commanded to take every thought captive, every thought. So here's that Bible verse. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And one of the ways you can do this is, of course, have a regular Bible study and under, and know the Good Shepherd, know, know what his uh, writings, his voice are, understand him. Right. If we're hearing something that doesn't match up with what the Bible says, then we really need to question that. And of course, that becomes very complicated because our world is, is in many ways not like the world that where Jesus walked as a person. There are a lot of different things going on. So I, th I think that gets really, that's very challenging, at least for me. It's very challenging um, because some of our topics are not written about in the Bible specifically. 
So Mark says, he came to realize through the SEER study that analytical thoughts are his and analytical thoughts are- Those connected thoughts like one plus one equals two, or he hit me in the shoulder and so my shoulder hurts and I hit him back. You know, those are kind of connected thoughts and reactions. And weighing pros and cons too. I mm -hmm. liked that. So those are our analytical thoughts. So spontaneous good thoughts come from Holy Spirit. So feeling the urge to pray for someone or a praise coming up in your heart without any stimulus or, or warnings um, or alerts. Or even like a song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just bubbles sure. up. And spontaneous evil thoughts come from evil spirits. So they would say, you're no good. Nobody really likes you or a temptation. For instance, I remember I was telling Ken this, we drove up to New Jersey to see his parents and we drove over the Delaware Memorial Bridge. And I, Ken and I both went to college at the University of Delaware. So we drove over that bridge. It's a pretty long bridge many, many, many times. And I would frequently have these thoughts, just, just open the car door and jump out. Like as I was going over the bridge, and I would, I would just think it was bizarre back then. I didn't know what it was. And of course, I never did it. But I believe now those were from evil spirits telling me, just open the door. I mean, it, and it wasn't a threatening or enticing voice. It was just a matter of fact, open the door and jump out. So those type of temptations, um, <laughs> it's good to recognize as Satan's voice. So here's another key. All right. Oh, well, this is what I was just saying before. Um, so if you become still, right? So as Lucinda was saying, that we have so many things that are stimulating us, so many things that are vying for our attention that it might be difficult to become still. But when we're still, then we can sense God's flow of thoughts. And Habakkuk said, I'll stand on my guard post. And Habakkuk knew that to hear God's quiet, inner, spontaneous thoughts, he had to first go to a quiet place, still his own thoughts and emotions. And Psalm 62, verse 5, encourage us, encourages us to silence our souls before God. There's a deep inner knowing, spontaneous flow in our spirits that each of us can experience when we quiet our flesh and our minds. And look at that last sentence. If we're not still, we will only sense our own thoughts. Now, Again, that's true um, for the for the most part, but I can I can tell you from experience that once you start to be able to discern God's thoughts, even when you're speaking, Holy Spirit can direct your words. Matter of fact, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, "Hey, don't worry about what you're going to say in front of that council of you know big wigs. Holy Spirit's going to give you the words." Um, and 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 hopefully, I frequently hear his thoughts as I'm speaking and I'm not necessarily still, but it's, but it's very good to make a practice of being still on a daily basis. So Mark says when he's still, if thoughts come like things he's forgotten to do, which happens to me all the time, then he writes them down in the moment so he can do them later. He writes them down. He doesn't try to ignore those thoughts because they'll just jumble up his mind. And then if thoughts of guilt or unworthiness or what have you come, he repents. He receives the, the cleansing of the blood of the lamb, puts on his robe of righteousness and sees himself spotless before God. He could have also taken those thoughts captive because as Ken said, we have authority. So in the name of Jesus, I bind any spirit of condemnation and command it to stop its work. Another key. Fix your eyes upon Jesus and ask to receive visions. And I think that ask is really important because the Bible says over and over again, ask and you will receive. And so we want to ask to receive. And so Habakkuk said, I will keep watch and see. And Habakkuk was actually looking for a vision as he prayed. So Mark says, since I believe the Bible is to be meant to be lived, that's kind of cool. The Bible is meant to be lived. Oh, I love that. The Bible is meant to be lived. I decided I would too begin looking with the eyes of my heart into the spirit world to see what I could see. Intuitive flow comes out of the vision being held before one's eyes. And so if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the intuitive flow 
is pure and comes from Jesus. And what's intuitive mean again? Tell us. No, I'm asking you. What's intuitive mean? Intuition. That, that's those things that you know without trying to figure it out or without analysis. Okay. Maybe. All right. I think that's right. So if we fix our eyes on Jesus, knowing that flow without trying to figure it out, that's pure. But if we fix our gaze on like um, a desire of our heart, like what would be a desire of our like heart? Like a new car. No. <laughs> <laughs> or, or let's say we want to get out of debt or we want, um, logically, or, or this is what God wants us to do to pray for people who are ill. But, but what this means is that our gaze is totally on this sick person that needs to be healed and not on Jesus and then bringing that problem to Jesus. So our intuitive flow is affected if we fix our gaze on something other than Jesus. And of course, to have a pure flow, I must become still and carefully fix my eyes on Jesus. So we don't start prayer with our issues. We start prayer by gazing upon him. And even Jesus taught us this in that the Lord's prayer. Lift up our eyes to the Father and behold him. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Maybe we need to say that like five times before we continue. I don't know. Maybe someone like me needs to say it five times. We must look if we want to see. So check out Daniel. This is chapter seven and three different verses. He sees a vision in his mind and he said, I was looking and then I kept looking and I kept looking. So let's just keep doing that. Like all our life long, let's keep looking for vision. Well, and I think the other part of that is a challenge for me, which is if I realize I'm, I have a vision, I'm getting, receiving a vision to stay with a vision like Daniel was, as opposed to popping back to my analytical mind, trying to figure out what it is while it's still unfolding. That's the challenge. Go, that's, and, and we're going to learn how to, well, we're going to practice and learn how to kind of stop those analytical thinkings and just flow with spirit as we write it down. So Daniel, or yeah, he needed to repent for not looking, or maybe this is Mark Berkler, Mark he needed to repent for not looking and begin presenting the eyes of his heart to the Lord and looking. So as he prays, he looks for Jesus and he watches and he listens as he speaks to him. And he does and says things that are on his heart. Oh, as Jesus does and things that says the things on his heart. Look at that first sentence. You can see Christ present with you because Christ is present with you. Ma Ma Matthew 1 verse 23, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Let's say that together, everybody. It's as, as simple, simple as, as that. that. No, let's go up and say all together. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. It's it as simple as that. In fact, the vision may come so easily you'll be tempted to reject it because you'll think it's just you. But keep recording the flowing pictures. And as you record, I have years and journals and journals of recording. And, and it's clear to me that it's God speaking. And that I have faith that I can recognize the voice of God because of this practice and years of of doing it yeah and the one of the important parts about doing that is that we're not trying to analyze this flow as right. it's coming in we're writing it down and then we can analyze it later after it's done correct which we'll be doing tonight okay the last key all right journaling which is writing out your prayers and god's answers so because we're going to have this two-way communication with god back and forth and as we do that one, well, probably the most important thing is that we have a record of it because otherwise we could forget some of what that communication is. But it also gets us in that process of asking questions and listening for answers. Very cool. We have to learn to relax. Cease our labors, enter into his rest. And that's when God's free to flow. So I know you all have a pencil and paper. 
And he says, smile, turn your attention toward the Lord and praise and worship, seek his face, write down, or you don't have to write exactly this, but say, hi, uh, I always start with, hi, Jesus. <laughs> I do. But he says, good morning, Lord, I love you. What do you want to say to me? And then become still, fix your gaze on Jesus, and you'll suddenly have a very good thought. Don't doubt it, simply write it down, and later you can go back and kind of sort of analytically analyze it, kind of sort of. So we're going to move into breakout groups, and this is what we're going to talk about. Just We're just going to do seven minutes in breakout groups. Let everybody get a chance to talk. Was there something new in this lesson or what, or what did stand out for you? If you've heard God before, how? If you've heard Satan before, how? And what do you think about what we're going to do in seven minutes? This two-way conversation with God, what do you think about it? So for those who are viewing on, um, on a later date, act, act, after the breakout groups, we're going to practice two-way journaling. And this is what we're going to do. Quiet ourselves down, look for a vision, look to Jesus, tune to the flow of spontaneous thoughts or pictures in your mind, writing them down without judging with childlike faith. All right, 